Welcome to the next class on variational methods for computer vision. We'll continue where we left off last time and that was optical flow estimation. So the challenge is that you're given uh, a sequence of images, a video, and you want to extract motion information. And in fact, all you can extract from the images themselves without any knowledge uh, about the 3D world is of course the motion on the image plane. And so if something moves towards the camera, that's a kind of motion that you cannot actually estimate from the images. And so that motion projected on the image plane is called the optical flow. And so is the motion that can actually be estimated. It's a, so, and in practice, the classical approach assumes that you are given two images, two consecutive images, and so you want to know where does one point, let's say if I draw it all into a single image plane, where does, let's say I have just one image, where does a given object, say in that location, where does it move over time? Where does it go from one uh, uh, time step to the next? And that is called the flow vector V, and so we want to estimate that flow vector for given the two images and and so we have images we call them i1 and i2 both from omega say to r gray value images and then we have the gradient that we can compute that would be um, um, the spatial derivatives and then we have the temporal derivative that we call it and in practice <coughs> for two images you can set it is just i2 minus i1 so for every pixel you just check how did the brightness change from one image to the next of course in practice we have more than two images we have a whole sequence of images but optical flow approaches are traditionally designed for the two-frame case. And so you, you would typically apply them to a video by running the same algorithm for each two consecutive images. And then you get the displacement field or motion field or optical flow field from one frame to the next. <coughs> I mentioned there are two classical approaches, the Lucas Canade approach that we discussed already last time, and the Horn and Chunk approach. To recap, the Lucas Canade approach assumes that the velocity vector v is constant in a certain neighborhood. And in the, in the first implementation, you would assume that, it, that the neighborhood contributes equally to the motion estimate and in a more sophisticated formulation you could say I give more weighting to the central pixels. So we'll assume that we consider a whole neighborhood around that point, we call it U sigma we call it, so there's some standard deviation sigma, that's the sigma here, and then a pixel x prime <coughs> x prime is here, x is here, and the pixel x prime will contribute to the motion estimate at location x. So this is for the velocity at location x. It contributes depending on how far it is. So this is a Gaussian which decays exponentially the further away I get from, from that location. And so points x prime will contribute more if they're closer to x and less if they're further away uh, relative to the scale sigma. <coughs> and contribute means that I'm imposing that this residuum should be small, should be zero. That was the optical flow constraint. Remember the flow constraint said that the gradient of the brightness function projected onto the velocity plus the time derivative of the velocity must be zero. Remember what we said was that the velocity of a point, moving point at time t uh, is constant and so the total derivative of this with respect to time and we saw this is nothing but dx by dt, the velocity of the point, and we saw that this must be zero. That is the brightness conservation and so we assume that points which move have the same brightness from one time step to the next. And that leads to this expression has to be zero in practice, of course, for various reasons, for noise, for uh, intensity fluctuations. It's typically never exactly zero, and so we minimize it in a least squares fashion. 
By the way, <coughs> this is a first uh, uh, comment uh, already at this point. Given what we talked about on variational methods on cost functions, you might at this point already ask why do we penalize the quadratic difference? Why don't we penalize a different? We could just penalize the norm, for example, right? And indeed, you can do that, and indeed, that will actually give you better flow estimates. But the equations will be more difficult. The advantage of imposing a quadratic penalty, as always, is the, that the gradient is then linear. You know, if you do the gradient on a quadratic cost function, you get a linear expression. And so, not surprisingly, when we solve this for the velocity, we get... Um, a linear equation system. And so that is the linear equation system. Matrix times velocity is some vector B. And the matrix is actually this uh, um, gradient matrix, the outer product of the gradient. So that is this matrix, I the x derivative squared, y derivative squared, and the product of the x and y derivative and that is then Gaussian smoothed. This is called, we called it, this is structure tensor is what it's typically called in the community. <coughs> structure tensor or structure matrix because it's actually just a matrix. It's a two by two matrix, <coughs> so not even a very big matrix and in <coughs> inverting two by two matrices is easy. <coughs> you can actually write down <coughs> Sorry about that. You can write down the inversion formula for a 2 by 2 matrix in closed form. <coughs> but what you need to, for the inversion is the determinant. Because at some point you divide by the determinant. So if the determinant of the matrix is zero, then the inverse cannot be computed. In fact, it doesn't actually exist. Right? Matrices are not always invertible, and the criterion for invertibility is the determinant. The determinant must be non-zero for the matrix to be invertible. In other words, I can solve this equation for the velocity if and only if m is invertible. If and only if the determinant of m is non-zero. And that leads us to the three possible scenarios that we can have in this setting. And one is indeed that the determinant is non-zero. That would be the case three. That means the two by two matrix has two uh, eigenvalues, has rank two. And that means we can invert it and compute the velocity vector v. And so v would just be m to the minus 1 applied to that vector b. And b is this vector here. And so the way this approach works, you can see, is it all, all you need is to compute spatial derivatives at each pixel and the temporal derivative at each pixel. And then you aggregate these derivatives with a Gaussian weighting in that neighborhood. And that gives you the matrix M, the vector B, and then you invert M and apply it to B, and you get the velocity. That is the third case where we actually have full rank. Uh, there is two cases that are not as nice in practice. One case is the extreme case if the gradient is zero for the entire window. That only happens really if, if you ha are in a completely constant brightness area. Right, so to recap, we had these three cases that you can have. If I observe a black box, say, on white ground, then the case one would be the case where the observer either sees the, just the white background or the observer sees just the black foreground. The case two is the case where he, sees, he or she sees an edge. And the case three is the case of a corner where you actually have gradients in different directions in your, in your window. The case two is if it's rank one, and that happens if, if all gradients are collinear, so if there is gradients in the image, so brightness variations, but all the brightness variations you see are in the same direction. So that would be here in this setting, 
the brightness changes are all in the vertical direction and so the gradients are all parallel which means that integral over the this matrix is just a product of these it is just a scalar multiple of these matrices of that particular matrix <coughs> and scalar multiple and this matrix itself has rank 1 because the only vector uh, uh, eigenvector is the gradient itself anything that is the vector that is normal to the gradient will be mapped to zero by this matrix and so there is one vector a non-zero vector the vector normal to the gradient so the vector in in direction of the edge down here and that vector will be mapped to zero which means it's not invertible the matrix doesn't have full rank it's not invertible and then as we mentioned earlier all you can do is compute this so-called normal flow that is the velocity across the edge so when the this um, when this box moves around you will only observe the motion in the vertical direction if you're looking at this edge <coughs> So these are the three cases, in fact, here, you remember here was this example that I showed of the three observers, one, two, three, and of course the best is three. And so what you often do in the Lucas Canade method, so the question is how do you apply this in practice? Well, quite simply, you compute that two by two matrix for every pixel in the image, you have that window, you compute the two by two matrix here, and you compute the determinant or you compute the two eigenvalues, doesn't really matter, and then the, you check the eigenvalues, it's a symmetric matrix, it's a positive semi-definite matrix, so the eigenvalues are non-negative, they're always positive or at best zero, and so you check are the two eigenvalues sufficiently large. If yes, then I can invert the matrix, and then I can compute the flow vector, and if no, then you don't compute the flow vector and you just go on to the next pixel. But you see already in some sense this method is at that level slightly suboptimal because in the case where you don't in cannot invert the matrix it doesn't use any of the information there. So the case 2 that does contain some information about the motion namely the normal velocity is not actually used because you do, you do want a full velocity vector and since it doesn't give you a full vector you say what the hell just move on to the next pixel and you kind of keep your fingers crossed that you know overall you have enough pixels that have a, a valid velocity estimate so you only consider really the case 3 and you only select those pixels that fall into category 3 and 1 and 2 you just neglect <coughs> so that is the method uh, here's the the equation and so in the case 3 you get a velocity estimate and this is what you see here uh, what you see I should actually explain that a little bit I think we've already seen examples of this this is a color coded flow, es uh, flow field where the colors uh, encode the direction of motion on that circle so green is moving left purple or uh, blue is moving down yellow is moving up red is right um, and the, the brightness is encodes the magnitude and so you see that by and large you know if you at least take the average color you would say okay it's predominantly green here so clearly that structure seems to be moving to the left Although you also see that there are parts which are colored in red or in blue and that is typically due to the fact that you have um, reflections here. You know, the assumption was that the brightness from one point to the next is preserved. If you actually look at the sequence you see that for specular structures that is not the case. Typically then the color that you see depends on the viewpoint you actually see the other structures reflected in the roof for example and that will give very misleading uh, flow estimates 
but we'll see later that you can actually get better flow estimates with more sophisticated cost functions. The other thing that typically happens with uh, Lucas Canade type flow estimates is that they are not very dense because you only consider the case 3 and so for many pixels you don't actually get any velocity out. And that is kind of undesirable. One of the challenges in flow estimation is that for many applications you really want some estimate of the motion for every pixel, not just for a subset of pixels. The other reason why the Lucas Canade is suboptimal is that this assumption that the flow vector is constant in a whole neighborhood is not a good assumption. We don't really know that much about the flow. We don't know whether it's really constant in a neighborhood. More particularly, what you tend to have in real-world applications, as you can see here, you tend to have objects that move and a background that in some cases moves but differently. And so you have very sharp transitions from one motion field, namely the car, to a very different motion field, the background. And so if you take that little window around points on the edge of the car, the assumption that the flow is constant in the whole window is completely wrong. Right? So in many f uh, pr problems you have, for example, that uh, the box may be moving here and the background may be moving in a completely different direction, which means if I take that window here, that we see here, then the flow is not constant in the window. Then the flow here is this way and at neighboring points it may be the points of the background, it's pointing in a completely different direction. So this assumption, the flow being constant in a certain neighborhood, is not a good assumption. It's too strong, a constraint, too strong an assumption. Uh, and so <coughs> there are actually more elegant solutions where the, the next thing actually with the Lucas Canade is, is that you clearly you compute the flow vector for each pixel separately. And you always start, you take a new window around the next pixel and you compute a flow vector for that, etc. So you don't actually compute the flow vectors at the same time. And this is where the variational approaches enter. And as I mentioned, this so-called horn and chunk approach is uh, among the first variational methods for computer vision. In fact, 1981 was the birth of variational methods in the context of computer vision, so this is one of the first papers. If you, if you compare, for example, two other seminal approaches that we discussed, the snakes appeared in 1987-88, Mumford Cha around the same time, so the late 80s, so this is clearly a couple of years earlier. The assumption here is quite similar to the Lucas Canade. We assume that the brightness is preserved from one image to the next. That assumption, I should say, even now, 30 years after, is still the dominant assumption in flow estimation. There are slight variations in improvement, but by and large, uh, uh, um, this assumption is still uh, used today. And that leads to this, in the linearized version, to this, uh, uh, this quadratic penalty. That is one point actually where people deviate nowadays, they don't try to linearize. Or there are more sophisticated versions, because this linearization actually only holds for small velocities. Once you have larger velocities, you are no longer, this is no longer correct. So what we see here is much like in the Lucas Canada, we penalize the quadratic error. But the key difference, and this is very important now, the key difference of the horn and chunk over the Lucas Canada is, is if we look <coughs> the Lucas Canada, we had a cost function E of V. Here, we also have a cost function E of V. But there's a huge difference. In the Lucas Canade, V was a vector for the velocity at one pixel. 
so it's just a 2D vector. Here, what we mean by V is an entire velocity field. So when I write E of V in horn and chunk, although it looks the same at first glance, what I have here is one cost associated with the entire velocity field, all velocity vectors for all pixels in one V. And so the V here is not a vector, it's a function. It's a function, so here we consider V in the horn and chunk. Horn chunk. <coughs> What we denote by V is a mapping from omega to R2. So it's a whole field of vectors associated with each pixel. And so this is a functional, much like in, in the variational calculus that we discussed, I assign a cost to the entire velocity field, which means I'm actually considering all velocity vectors at the same time. And what is that cost? Well, I check how large is the, the um, optical flow uh, uh, constraint. It should be, so here this residuum should be small for each pixel. And so I integrate over pixels uh, uh, with coordinates x and y. And then, <coughs> in contrast to the Lucas Canada approach which says V should be constant in the whole window, now I say a somewhat softer version of it says from one pixel to the next the velocity can change but it should not change too much. In other words, the gradient of the velocity field should be small meaning neighboring pixels don't need to have the exact same velocity but the similar velocity, meaning if the velocity changes drastically from one point to the next, it can do that, but that will cost a lot for the energy. Depending on how large the value of lambda is, smoothness of the velocity field will be enforced to a more or less strong degree. At that point, you can say, why don't we just drop that constraint? entirely. Why don't we just leave that constraint out? Well, the issue is that, um, the, as we said, you cannot get a velocity for each pixel. And so, for certain pixels, <coughs> you cannot get velocities. So you need a certain neighborhood information. The reason for that is uh, you can see it in the aperture problem, but really the reason is we are assuming that corresponding points are identified by having the same brightness. But of course, if, if that's all you use as a constraint, you know, for any pixel, I can easily find you millions of pixels in an image that all have the same brightness. Somewhere in the image there's always some pixel with the same brightness, right? If I take a real-world picture and then you say, oh, I can find the correspondence by assuming that the corresponding point has the same brightness in the two images. Well, um, let's say a point here, then you know, you can just search the image and say, oh, I found a point with the same brightness, let's take that one. Yeah, of course, that you can do that, but that will not give you a meaningful velocity field. And so you need some additional assumption, and the assumption that you use is spatial regularity. You say, if that point moved here, then the neighboring point typically must have moved into the vicinity, somewhere in the neighborhood, meaning the displacement vector v for the neighbor pixel is going to be similar. That's the assumption. And that's typically a good assumption because objects tend to be compact and so when they move around, neighboring points tend to move in the same way. Not always, of course, but uh, in general it's not a bad assumption to regularize the whole problem. Another way to see why this regularity term is important is if you drop that regularity term, then the velocity is only defined up to vectors that are orth orthogonal to the gradient. Because any, as we saw earlier, any contribution of v orthogonal to the gradient will not 
actually play a role here and so there is a non-uniqueness in the solutions. I have for each pixel an infinite number of possible uh, uh, velocity vectors, right? And to, to, to give a, a unique solution to the whole problem, we add that regularizer, which says, among all of these, I want to favor the ones which give me the smoothest velocity field. That's essentially what we're doing here. By the way, notation-wise, this is a little bit of an abuse of notation. I was telling you earlier that this NABLA operator is called the gradient or the divergence, depending on whether you apply it to a scalar or a vector field. What I mean here is actually not the divergence. So NABLA V, although V is a vector, is not the divergence, and so I wrote it down here. What I mean with this is a shorthand notation for the gradient of the first component squared plus the gradient of the second component squared. So we really want to know how does the flow vector change in space, and that means the first and the second component. Now you might say, so why do I write it like that? Well, it's to save a little bit of space, because it's a little shorter. And so in the literature you always find this notation, but it should be taken with care. It doesn't mean you're talking about the divergence, it's the gradient, but component-wise. And so, in contrast to the Lucas Canade approach, this Horn and Shank approach actually gives rise to a dense flow field estimator, where you will get the velocity vector by minimizing this variational principle, you get the velocity vector for each pixel in the image. And the way it works, maybe a little more on it, is that in practice, you get velocity vectors from locations where you have prominent gradients. Because if the gradient is zero in some location, then clearly the whole thing uh, uh, will disappear, this term here. And so for pixels where the gradient is zero, the velocity from the data term can be anything. Doesn't, you know, the data term doesn't care. And so for regions that have no structure in the sense that the gradient is zero, constant brightness areas, there is a fill-in effect from this regular riser. In the sense that you're going to have some pixel that has a strong brightness edge, and so you can estimate some component of the velocity here. And then you may have areas that have no brightness, say, uh, change, like that are constant in color. But what happens is through this regular riser, you fill in from the neighborhood. You say whatever it, it should be there is, is similar velocities to the neighbors. And so that creates a fill-in. And in fact, how is that fill-in created? We'll see in a second. It's by a diffusion process. And why is that? This is called the Dirichlet energy, if you recall. And minimizing the Dirichlet, say in a gradient descent, for example, gives rise to a diffusion. And so what happens is this term will try to identify velocity vectors based on the local gradient information. And for the rest of the image, that information is diffused in, into the neighborhoods of where there's no structure. Here actually is the Euler-Lagrange equations. So here I wrote out the, the Horn and Shank approach uh, in, uh, in more detail. So this is the gradient times the velocity vector. So the x component of the gradient times v1 plus the y component of the gradient times v2. Time derivative here. This is the data term squared. And then the smoothness, as I said, is the gradient of the first component squared plus gradient of the second component. The Euler-Lagrange equations you can check for yourself are these. I wrote partial derivatives now because I have the, the v's actually con consists of two variables, the first component and the second. And if you do that here, you see the first component of the velocity is here and here. And so you get this expression. And the second component is v2 is here and here. And this, you, you can just compute it with the standard Euler-Lagrange calculus. Uh, 
remember that calculus uh, to recap was if I have L of V and V prime integrated over dx then dE by dV was dL by dV minus d dx of dL by dV prime right and and that is supposed to be zero at the extremum so that's the extremality condition and if we apply that here you can check for yourself we get exactly this expression and so there are many ways to solve it. One is the Gauss-Seidel method. It's a linear equation system, right? So you can apply the Gauss-Seidel or the Jacobi solver. And uh, as I said, this second term here leads to this fill-in effect. And you could also do a, a gradient descent to compute it, and that would, be, uh, um, that would give you a diffusion process this second component being the diffusion uh, component. And so in practice, where there is no gradient or brightness variations in the image, and so locally I can actually not see any motion, I just use my neighborhood information and say, well, you, you know, I ask the neighboring pixels and say, you tell me what motion you have, and then that's kind of averaged. That's what happens in this diffusion process. Here is a result. <coughs> and so you can see this is the same input images, one of two images, and here's the motion estimates. And this is actually quite interesting. If you compare, the result of the horn and chunk here is not really great. If you compare to the Lucas Canade, one of the things you see is that the Lucas Canada tends to have larger velocities. The colors are more pronounced. And here it's actually somewhat, there is more velocity information, but actually uh, that which is more tends to be not actually correct, right? So there's lots of red, blue, and green. If we compare to the horn and chunk, the velocity estimates seem to be somewhat more correct in the sense that the motion is associated with this region is predominantly in uh, going to the bottom left, which is the correct motion, and here the tramway is predominantly red, but there is not so much. And this is not uncommon, actually, this is well known for the horn and chunk approach, that it tends to underestimate the motion. The reason being that for regions where there is no information, uh, um, this fill-in kind of tends to, re and also the, the data term tends to lead to a, a, a smaller velocity. And so at that point, you might say, okay, the approach doesn't work as well. And in fact, if you look at the history, the Lucas Canada, I mentioned it before, had more impact in the first, say, 10 or 20 years after publication. But of course, you know, with all the knowledge that you already have on variational methods, you can imagine, once you have a variational approach, you can generalize it in many ways. You can expand it, because in, in, so in other words, the look, the, sorry, the horn and chunk it may not give better performance in the first implementation, but there is room for generalization. It's more elegant because you are computing all velocity vectors in one sweep, in one approach, by minimizing a single functional, in fact, a convex functional in this sense. So that in principle is good, but remember the functional is convex only because we linearize this optical flow. Strictly speaking, what we should be using, and we'll see that in a second, we should use a cost function, a data term that says the brightness of image 1 displaced by a velocity v should be the same as the brightness of, uh, um, of image 2. Or, or vice versa, actually, I think it's vice versa. I of x minus I2 of x plus v, plus v. Meaning, if, and then integrate over dx. Meaning, the, the brightness at pixel x at the first image should be the same as the brightness at pixel x plus v in the second image. 
that's what we should be using, but what we are using is a, essentially a Taylor expansion of this. If you linearize this expression in V, then what you get is you can rewrite this as I2 of x plus uh, or with a minus here minus V transpose gradient I2. And then you see that I1 minus I2 is just minus the temporal derivative IT. And then you have minus V transpose nabla I2. And so this is essentially what we have here, right? If you square it, uh, for example, then these are dropped and then you get exactly the, the optical flow constraint. And so what we have here is an approximation of the true brightness constancy linearized. The way we got this was by by computing a derivative, so it's a linear approximation. And it means that it only holds for small velocities and not for larger velocities, and that is one of the shortcomings here of these approaches. Actually, of both the Horn and Chunk and the Lucas Canade, they both work with this linearized version. But of course the key problem, and this remains an open problem uh, uh, until today actually, is that this data term of the optical flow is not convex. Why is it not convex? Because the velocity is inside the argument of I2, and so depending on what the brightness is, you can have any kind of functional dependency. This linearized version by construction is convex. You linearize it so it's linear in V, and then this is quadratic in V, but definitely convex. Um, yeah. So we see the results are not great, but uh, at least promising in some sense. If we compare <coughs> Lucas and Canada and Horn and Chunk, so we are still in the 80s, uh, uh, 81, both approaches, 1981, so 30 years ago. These were the breakthroughs on motion estimation from videos. Uh, if we compare the two approaches, the Lucas Canada is very fast and very simple because you're not solving a variational approach you're not you know if we go back here you have to apply a linear solver here you know that that's a bit involved it's you know f a numerical algorithms person would say well that's pretty fast you know a linear solver gauss idle and you can parallelize it so nowadays this can be done fast but never as fast as just running something for every pixel independently a two by two matrix inversion that we have in the lucas canade run for every pixel you can hardly beat that with an iterative solver so definitely the Lucas Canade is fast and still faster, even with all the GPUs, still faster today than the variational approaches. And it's very simple to compute and it often gives acceptable results and is fairly robust in practice. We saw some results and it's okay. It's not terrific, but it's okay. And so depending on what you want, even today, if you want a really fast algorithm that runs, say, on a smartphone without a GPU, etc., you might want to use the Lucas Canade. It's simple, it's fast, it's easy to implement. The horn and chunk on the long run, though, has many advantages. First of all, by construction, it gives you a dense flow field. Secondly, it's more general in the sense that it doesn't just impose that the motion is constant, but it allows for non-translational motion, to, for very general motion fields, actually. For example, if you want to... Uh, want to estimate fluid flows from videos. This is a, an application that tends to be important in, for example, if you want to understand whether an airplane wing works well and you want to see what is the flow of air around the airplane wing, what you can do is you can add little particles into the air and then film that with a high frequency camera that has a hundred or more frames a second, and then you can try to estimate that motion from the videos to get an understanding what is moving here. 
and that can be done and in these settings you have very general motion fields with turbulences and whatnot where the assumption that the neighborhood has constant motion is just pure wrong and this is the nice thing, the horn and chunk is more general, it doesn't assume constant motion, it assumes smooth motion in the sense that the gradient squared should be small, but you can imagine we can do far more sophisticated regularizers and that has been done in the last couple of years. For example, just to mention one, one example, if you really were to estimate fluid flows from videos, there are physical equations that govern how a fluid moves. They're called the Navier-Stokes equations. And what you can do as a regularizer, you can say whatever flow field the algorithm generates, it should be consistent with these equations. It should be consistent with the Navier-Stokes equations and so you can design regularizers that basically impose that. That impose that whatever flow field is being estimated, it should match in some way the these um, Navier-Stokes equations. And then you get a very sophisticated approach that produces physically meaningful flow fields. And this is something you can only do in a variational approach. You cannot do that by treating each pixel separately. And so Quite obviously, I think after a lot of the things we've already discussed on variational methods in this setting, although the results of the horn and chunk at a first glance do not seem better than the Lucas Canade, you, s you can imagine there's far more potential in this approach than in the Lucas Canade approach. And from a mathematical point of view, the linearization leads to a strictly convex functional, so you actually get a unique solution, and you have this fill-in effect uh, that you can regulate with the parameter lambda. The stronger, the higher lambda, the more of a fill-in you get, etc. And we'll see you can actually estimate flow fields that are non-smooth, that are discontinuous by tweaking the regularizer, by basically starting from that regularizer and saying what is not good about it, how can I improve it, how can I bring in the right knowledge that actually matches my problem. And what that knowledge is really depends actually. For example, if you estimate motion of organs in, in the body from medical images, then this regularizer is not so bad. Because, let's say, if I move the liver, every point in the neighborhood is going to move along, so there is a certain smoothness. And the neighboring organs will move along because there's not going to be any holes created, right? So organs don't tend to rip apart in their motion. And so you tend to have smooth velocity or motion fields. Instead, in a real world, say, outdoor application of tracking a car, the car may be moving coherently, but the background moves very differently. And so in these settings you do have discontinuities in the motion field and then that regularizer is not so good. Then you would, the first thing you would do is drop the square. Why? Because you don't want to over penalize discontinuities. If the gradient gets very strong in some location, I don't want the cost to go up uh, um, drastically. And so by dropping the square here, I would still penalize discontinuities, but not so much anymore. And we'll see that this actually leads to much better flow fields. This is where we'll stop today, the end of the discussion of Lucas, Canade, Horn and Chunk. And then next time we'll continue with more state-of-the-art variational approaches to flow estimation. Thank you. <laughs>